Okay, thank you, uh, Heijin, and uh, and also the your colleagues for setting up this uh, wonderful exchange between Singapore and uh, Korea, right? especially between our university, National University of Singapore, and the Seoul National University. Uh, fun fact is that we both share the same three letters in our university, <laughs> right? And so that's kind of cool, I thought. Uh, so I think uh, we have many good friends at SNU and uh, hopefully we can make uh, new friends uh, today. So thank you also for the students for attending this session. Uh, usually I like to have uh, more exchange. Uh, so you know, feel free to message and put in the chat if you have any questions throughout the talk so that uh, you know, we can either answer it when I see the chat or at the end, right? I'm sure you have a lot of questions uh, about some of these uh, about what I talk about, so don't don't be shy, right? I like to also learn what you think about as as I uh, as I talk about the materials. So that also gives me some feedback on how I can improve my uh, lecture. Right? If there's no questions, then it would make me feel really bad because that means probably none of you understood any, anything. So uh, today I'll talk about s some reasons on why I think modern electronics. Um, are becoming stretchable, right? And also what that means uh, for the future of, uh, of some of these uh, capabilities that we're used to, for example, your smartphone and all your computing devices. What does that mean for, for us? Uh, and, and currently I am uh, in the material science engineering department at uh, NUS. So before I start, I usually have this uh, for, for lectures, I, I like to have some uh, Q and A. So, if you don't mind, if you have a smartphone or you're uh, using your computer, go to this uh, website, oev.com slash uh, to basically it's a short survey or quiz. Uh, and I will have some of these throughout the lectures. Okay, if uh, I'll, I'll give you maybe 10 more seconds to get to this web page. Okay. Okay, so I guess the first question for me to understand you better, right, is to find out what you're interested in. Uh, so feel free to enter anything uh, that comes to mind right, in terms of uh, whether it's what you're studying or what you want to do in the future. So I can hopefully tailor the talk uh, better to your interest. Uh, is the... Is it like a, is the, is the quiz, is the page active? Oh, so, yes, I can okay. access uh, to the page. Great, because I somehow don't see a uh, mm -hmm. response. Okay, so for some reason, nobody is responding. So I wonder if it's the... Okay, great. So there's some... Okay, so it looks like people are interested in ro robots, uh, soft robots. So there's some computational uh, interests, computer, computer science, I guess, materials. Organic materials, electronics, quite big. Seems a lot of you are interested in electronics. So reliability, interesting, okay. Uh, okay, you might not be able to see my response, correct? I think. So, are the responses supposed to show up in this screen? Yeah, let me check. Uh, maybe I will share this other screen so that you can see the response. Is this, uh, are you able to see this? Oh, yeah, now I can see. Okay. Great. Yeah, so so this app always does this, you know. So anyway, it's a, it's a bit annoying. 
Uh, so I do, I'll switch screens. Okay, so good. I think we have quite a good uh, response. I think a lot of people are interested in electronic materials, uh, properties, uh, some organic uh, materials, uh, also some bit of robotics and some reliability. And thermal is interesting. Uh, I don't really, uh, will not talk so much about thermal uh, here, but mostly about electronics uh, properties and reliability. Uh, biodegradable is also interesting. Okay, great. Thank you for the inputs. And I will switch back. Okay, so as Seiji mentioned, I, I basically started my lab in NUS uh, coming to about four, four, five years, coming to about five years now. And uh, we're interested in the intersection between material science and uh, machines, right? And so one of the things to enable smarter machines is they need to have data, right, to run their algorithms. In this case, everybody likes to call algorithms AI now because it looks, it sounds a lot. But it's easier to uh, pronounce and also sounds a lot more fancy. But really, I think uh, AI is runs on machines and in order for machines to get the data, they need sensors. Right? So I thought there is an opportunity to create uh, a group where we focus on building sensors from new materials and hopefully they can enable newer forms of intelligence, right? especially machine intelligence. Uh, I focus on a few things. Uh, one is sensors, so mechanical sensing uh, materials, stretchable electronics, making devices more stretchable. Uh, the other one is self-healing devices, uh, which hopefully I think in 50 years would play a play a role in, in making our technology consumption more sustainable. Uh, and lastly, neuro-inspired devices. So for today, since there's a lot of focus on materials uh, and organic materials and robotics style interest, I won't talk so much about uh, neuro-inspired devices. I think the time might be too short. So I'll focus a lot more on the self-healing materials as well as stretchable electronics in some senses. So why do we care about making devices uh, stretchable? Okay, so I like to play this video because it highlights how intelligent or trainable or learning capabilities of, human, uh, of humans. So this person has no visual input, is using his skin, which is a you know very soft covering uh, that senses the environment and is able to activate his muscles in a way that allows it uh, to prevent harm to himself and also do useful things, right? He's chopping up vegetables, <laughs> right? And first uh, disclaimer is please, uh, uh, word of caution is please don't try this, right? If you try this at home, uh, you might hurt yourself because you need some training. Uh, but I can give you a small tip. If you look at what he's doing is he's actually using the front uh, surface of his index finger right to make sure that he senses the flat part of the blade so he's able to slice properly All right so the ability to use skin as a data source to understand the environment is very powerful it allows you to do everything right from the moment you are you wake up to you know even when you're sleeping you know that you, you're not falling off the bed right so there's just so much data that the skin processes that we are we take it for granted, but it's a very important source of data for machines, right? And then we go into why uh, some properties of skin that allows it to be so functional. Now, if you lose your sense of touch, actually scientists have studied this, if you have proper functioning muscles, but we remove the sensation from, from you, right? Uh, so imagine, for example, you're sitting cross-legged for a long time, or uh, you, you restrict blood flow to your hands. You know, maybe you, you're sleeping in the wrong way. Sometimes you wake up and your hand feels numb or your leg feels numb. So this is, the, this is actually what this person would feel because we chemically create this situation. Uh, so this person is asked to do a one task, a very simple task. And the task is to light a matchstick. And most of us can light a matchstick in, um, you know, maybe 10 seconds, right? But if we restrict the data from the skin to uh, the muscles and, and maybe the brain, what happens is you're unable to feel your environment. And as a result, it becomes very hard to take a mesh stick out of, the, out of the box, even with vision, right? So this person is not my blindfolded. Uh, this task now takes a lot longer. The person has a lot more difficulty. 
although the muscles are fine, you know, there's nothing wrong with the muscles. The only difference is the data uh, of touch is not transmitted to process to be processed, right? So, so he, this example also explains very well why, if you think about machines, for them to be, hope, uh, you know, ideally more intelligent, they will need data streams such as those that the skin or some kind of skin interface can can uh, process and transmit. All right. So then we move to the concept of intelligence, right? So having said this, uh, what do you think human intelligence requires? So here's another short quiz. I'm going to change my screen. Yeah, so if you go to the same link, uh, I'd like to uh, you know, understand what you think human intelligence requires. I think we have some responses now. So judgment, right? So judgment refers probably to making certain decisions, uh, sensing of the environment, right? That was quite clear from the examples earlier. There's uh, also the logic, right? The sense of understanding what to do, right? Uh, thinking. Thinking, I, I believe, is uh, related to understanding, right? Learning. So, so education, right? Good. I, I'm glad you uh, also mentioned that, right? Uh, human intelligence requires us to learn, right? And getting a good education at SNU or you know, NUS is clearly helpful, right? For your intelligence. Uh, recognition, right? So the ability to classify, or right, basically look at something and know what that some that thing is okay good i think we have uh i think you've covered a lot and clearly all of you are very highly intelligent right uh, you're able to understand uh, my question and give very good answers right so i think intelligence for humans in particular right uh is really related to our perception of the environment how much we can perceive uh the how much data we can understand from the environment right so I'm going to switch back to uh, the other screen. I'll shift these things out of the way. Okay, good. Thank you for your response. So, uh, you know, feel free to continue entering. Uh, these will all be uh, kept in the system uh, later. So the human intelligence, uh, my personal, um, believe right is that it's mediated or allowed uh, by our senses and we have many senses right you have a smell touch taste vision hearing some of you may have the sixth sense right uh, or what is also probably called intuition so the ability to combine the data streams together very quickly uh, is important and of course touch as I mentioned is a very important aspect now how do we enable touch is the question I hope we can uh, you know, have some potential answers to uh, after today's lecture. So one way is through materials. And materials uh, are a big feature of advanced societies like hu human civilization. If you look at how humans have progressed, understanding of materials, making use of materials and applying them has enabled us to create uh, different technological eras, right? For example, uh, first, we are, we learn how to use metals, and that was of course the, you know, the Bronze Age and so on. Yeah. So after that, uh, we learn how to use materials that maybe are not conducting, uh, but we can make them conducting, and that is uh, what we call semiconductors, right? And of course, then uh, other forms of metals as we start to purify uh, materials from uh, 
uh, raw minerals, right? All the uh, and basically uh, concentrating them and then uh, using them in different processing methods. So there's a lot of materials science and engineering required to create an advanced technological society like what we have you know in humans uh, and in the past uh, we have focused a lot on materials that are i would say rigid right so one way to measure how stiff a material is is through this property called young's modulus and young's modulus has a is, is the form it has a units of pascals and the higher the number the more stiff the materials which means if you apply a force to the material how much it will compress or change its shape uh, in one dimension in that dimension of force uh, in the direction of force is the modulus right so modulus is in some sense a measure of hardness or softness traditional electronic materials they're used to right like those um, you know computers are made of silicon uh, also many metals that, that we use and these are very stiff and hard materials. They are more than a gigapascals, right? Probably hundreds of gigapascals or higher. Uh, and if you look at some of the examples I've shown, the skin, for example, is a very soft material. In some sense, the skin is like a soft computer, right? It analyzes, transducts the information from the environment and then transmit that to some process in this case for humans is our nervous system and the skin is only about a mega pascal sometimes less uh, and if you are you have very good skin probably most people your skin will be a lot softer right and i'm sure uh, a lot of uh, industry right the, the skincare industry you know actually um, helps to make your skin look younger but my point is that the skin has uh, the very good quality uh, which is softness to allow it to form a good interface right with the environment right for example if you have a cup that is curved right in this case you have a cup that's curved i'm able to hold the cup without even looking i'm able to have my skin touch the cup even though it's quite a rigid object my skin can conform right and the reason it can conform is that it has this quality of softness right so before i go on to the next thing i have one more question now and this is a question I asked uh, some of my classes here at uh, NUS also, uh, is as you use your technology today, all right, how many elements uh, do you think we are using? Uh, and I have this other question, right, which is in your smartphone today, maybe whether you're using a Samsung phone or iPhone, right, I think the materials that go into them are quite similar. Uh, how many elements do you think there are in such a device? So if you go to the same link, you can you see the poll. And I'm curious also to just uh, understand how many of you think uh, what kind of uh, numbers you know actually being used in a smartphone in terms of the number of elements. Because today I think the you know when I you know uh, unfortunately unfortunately I'm a bit older right and I grew up in a time where there were actually no smartphones right so this was this was a question that could not have happened just uh 20 years or 25 years ago you know and so, so, so i mean even uh that iphone only came out in around 27 2007 i think around 2007 2006 probably closer to 2008 so you know there's you, you all of you probably have grew up with technology right but how many of you know how many elements are used It can be, you know, feel free to make a guess. It seems like there is, uh, I hope the poll is uh, debated. Yeah, it should be activated. Okay, so I don't get any responses yet. So there's two possibilities. Uh, either you are probably uh, multitasking, <laughs> doing something else, or you're not. Uh, you don't realize I've asked the question. Uh, 
Okay. Oh, uh, one more other possibility. Probably trying to Google for the right answer. So don't don't worry about Googling. Just uh, just give a number, answer whatever comes to mind. Okay, for some reason, I don't see the response could be a system issue. Let me just uh, do a check. Are you able to see the web page? Okay, so there is, maybe somehow it's not refreshing on my end. Hang on, just double check the web page. Okay, yeah, you, I did see the results, but somehow it's not uh, reflecting here. Hang on. There was 18. Ah, okay, I understand why not. Hang on, figure it out. The reason is I need to go to the next slide. Okay, good. So we have um, quite a mix of uh, distribution, right? Most people either guess lower, uh, around middle, right? So about, I think 30 seems to be the most, right? Okay, so the right answer is that we have uh, oh, more than 40, right? between 40 to 50, right? Uh, elements being used in the, in, in a smart device like a cell phone, right? Uh, and your cell phone is probably, you know, today a very sophisticated device that uh, allows and perform many functions, right? So I'm, I'm just gonna, uh, you know, just give a sort of a brief highlight of some of these elements here. You can see that we have uh, silicon, obviously, and a lot of metals uh, and, and uh, some other type of uh, heavy metals. Right, and all these uh, can potentially be uh, environmentally, you know, uh, unsustainable. Uh, so here's a, just some example of the many different elements, right, that are being used. Right, and the carbon is used as a lot in the plastic, a lot of uh, covering and, and so on, where a lot of polymers are used. And this we will talk about uh, today, all right? So my point is that a lot of science, uh, material science, a lot of, understanding of materials and in the engineering goes into making a, a smart device. So if you think about that and extend some of your interest in robots, uh, then there's a, a lot more newer forms of knowledge that needs to be created uh, and, and learned 
right, in order to create next the future generations of robots. And material science is a great study, right, to be able to build very complex systems. Uh, in one of these, uh, of, there are many different numbers being thrown around, but one of the numbers I found is roughly 46, right, for an iPhone. Right, but it's probably in today's even more sophisticated uh, devices, maybe more. But you can see that a lot of them are, are relying on what we call inorganic materials uh, and or heavy metals. Right? So these can, can present some challenges, uh, which is why we're starting to look at new forms of uh, devices that are powered not by silicon, for example, but by carbon. And of course, uh, I think SNU has many uh, excellent research uh, work done, right? So Professor Lee and, and so on. many of them has done excellent work really trying to use newer forms of materials to perform intelligent functions, right? Uh, and this field really started quite some time back in uh, to the, around 2008. Uh, and that was the time I was fortunate enough uh, to join uh, Tsenam Bao's group at Stanford to study uh, and create technologies using carbon based electronics. Uh, and uh, along the way, uh, what I've also started to realize is that there will be more and more uh, other types of new applications that nobody has even thought about. And many of you might go on to create some of these groundbreaking innovations. So what has happened from a trend perspective, right? if you look at how we have evolved technology in, in terms of computing, is that we have now made them a lot more softer. Right, there's just a lot more uh, knowledge in making them uh, move from a room, a giant room of uh, computers, right? Uh, many switches are all mechanical. Uh, some of them um, rely a lot of power. Like back then, it takes a whole room, and they are very slow. Now, to a, a smartwatch or a cell phone, that is essentially a supercomputer. Uh, and we are only, I think, at the early stages of making soft computers uh, smarter, right? And that many of these research uh, have allowed soft computers now to be made, right? Uh, allowing them to be stretched and put on skin. And some of these uh, papers, I just highlight, you know, some of the uh, more prominent ones, but there's really a lot of uh, research going on in this area, right? In the future, um, and this is really, you know, future guessing is always difficult, but I think that you probably won't have a smartphone. You probably will just have a piece of clothing that is intelligent enough to do all kinds of computing for you, right, in sense the environment. And in order for that to happen, right, we will need to make devices stretch, right, because humans, we move around a lot, uh, and we need to allow computing even when there's strain. And so this is what be what I will talk about for the rest of my lecture, right? So I hope I at least have... Uh, excited enough, right, to say that, well, you know, stretchable electronics is still a very, I would say, early in its development, if you look at the history of how devices have um, evolved, right, and there's a lot of exciting research that can be done. So the skin can stretch really well and not break, right, and this is a famous photo of uh, this person with a genetic disease that allows his skin to be stretched uh, more than the usual person, right. For me, I probably can stretch like less than half of what he can do. Uh, but importantly, he doesn't fail in terms of uh, breaking. The skin actually, firstly, is able to stretch and secondly, maintain function. And there are many ways to do that uh, through material science and engineering. Right? One of them is through the use of polymers, which are carbon-based materials with metals. Uh, and importantly, uh, we can also use conducting polymers right, that are conductive enough to be used as a, uh, as a conductor, right, uh, for stretchable electronics. So there's some, here are just, uh, this is actually edited by uh, Professor Lee Tae Wu, right, uh, who was uh, very kindly allowed me to contribute a, a chapter. Uh, if you're interested, you can definitely look at this um, uh, textbook uh, series, right. So the idea is that we can have many strategies to make devices that inherently do not stretch uh, become stretchable, or we can use uh, inherently stretchable materials to perform electronic functions.
So one of the strategies that uh, we have been exploring, right, is exactly that, right? Using, can we use devices or materials that can already stretch? And then we combine them with uh, functional materials such as metals that we already know are very good conductors, right? So that's kind of what we are, our approach is. Uh, but there are many also other good approaches uh, by making nanomaterials and different kinds of processing methods. Uh, but as you make them non-bulk, basically you remove them from the bulk properties and you change their configuration. What happens is you usually will have a decrease in conductivity. Right? So in order for electronics to perform at very high, uh, I would say high performance, you will need some strategies uh, where you need them to stretch a lot without changing its high conductivity. And one way to do that is to create structures. Uh, here is an example of a microstructure. I would say maybe uh, hundreds of micron tile structure where we are able to stretch a piece of wire right, uh, without sacrificing its conductivity. Now, most wires have only a 1% to 2% strain from if you're made of metals. right? Uh, but if you can st structure them in a proper way, then you can allow them to stretch 150% without affecting its conductivity. So here's an example where we actually use such structured wires uh, in, uh, in a circuit uh, where we see that this electrical circuit, the current flow is constant, right? And this strategy right, would allow devices that are traditionally unstretchable uh, to be connected to each other in a stretchable manner. This LED is a good example of uh, what is actually being used in a smartphone or TV screen. And most TV screens actually use this form of LEDs uh, that either have uh, rigid encapsulation or they're uh, packaged in a way that don't allow them to be soft. Uh, the reason is to protect them mechanically. But if we can connect them together, then we are able, in, through our what we call structured wires or e-helix, what we call this uh, electrical helixes, then we can allow them to stretch, right? And this strategy is uh, quite scalable. You are able to have multiple conductors uh, woven together in this manner, right, in this structure, and you allow them to retain its uh, shape when you stretch and release, right? And we can also have more wires than one within the same kind of uh, volume right uh, for example we have we had, what i shown earlier was a single now we have multiple what we call e helix we can now have up to 16 e helix and of course uh, i don't know how you how many of you are gamers but clearly my some of my group members are gamers uh, so what they did was i thought it was a fun experiment uh, it's just to see well can this be high performance enough to make a stretchable uh, wire for your electronic devices. Right, here's an example, you can, uh, can play, a, play a computer game. You can also use this to enable robots uh, that have sensors all over and because we can start to interconnect uh, different devices over the surface area. In this case, it's a hand and we can make, for example, a glove device or directly put these sensors on a robotic hand and then interconnect them through this e-helix. Right. And through, so using this strategy, I think you can network quite a lot of different um, devices together, right? whether it's to collect data or sense the environment. I mentioned that it's actually not uh, changed its conductivity. And so we actually strain this material multiple times uh, up to 150%. And you see that actually the conductivity doesn't change, but it's quite natural because we introduce um, additional length into uh, into the wire, right? That actually doesn't cause it to achieve uh, or to be strained sufficiently to actually not, uh, to actually break. But this doesn't work for all cases and we're interested to find out why some cases don't work. Uh, so when do you think this strategy will fail, right? Uh, one way to think about it is about exchange of energy, right? And so we studied this through volume ratio of the materials. So if you have a single wire and you put it into a elastic material, like a piece of the rubber that we use, uh, what happens is when you stretch it, you're doing work, right? As you stretch the 
the wire, you have energy input. Now, when you release it, the stored energy right in the elastic material, which is the polymer chains, now will do the work to restore the original shape. But if you do not have enough polymers to restore the wire into its original shape, then you have this thing we call residual strain, right? So this was actually, uh, we, we, we did quite a bit of study, right? Including simulations uh, to understand what's happening when you stretch this kind of e-helix. So as you stretch this e-helix, you can see that there is some strain in the wires. And this strain needs to be overcome by the energy from stored in the polymers and the elastomers. So there is a loss of energy that you need sufficient uh, volume of the elastomers to overcome. And we found that if you have a one-to-one -one ratio, which means in this case, it's the diameter of the e-helix of the e helix helical structure to the diameter of the rubber material, uh, then you are not able to uh, overcome this uh, energy loss and the work done, right? So you have residual strain. And it turns out that no matter how many, how much elastomers you put into this composite, the, there will always be some residual strain. But if the residual strain is less than a percent it, or even 5%, generally you don't see it and uh, it doesn't affect your performance, right? So what we found is that for this particular material, which is the elastomer with the certain modulars, you need a certain diameter cross-section ratio, right? So of at least three to one in order to have this uh, e-helix return uh, to its original, close to its original shape in length, right? And so there's, we also studied uh, multiple helixes and so on. So if you're interested, uh, you can read uh, the uh, paper right, in Advanced Healthcare Materials. Um, but I think that this is an interesting strategy and we're trying to think of uh, other users for this technology. And if you have any uh, interest, you know, feel free to contact me after that, All right? So one of the things we are looking at is maybe we can make smart textiles. Right. And so we actually make uh, heart rate monitoring devices that gives you uh, certain data about whether you're, whether you're exercising or not, right? because we know your heart rate. So for example, we can have the e-helix power a sensor that measures your heart rate right, on your fingertip. And then we have the e-helix power LED devices on a shirt. And before exercising, you, know, you obviously have a low heart rate, but as you exercise, you, you can track the increase in the heart rate. And of course, the nice thing about uh, this ex experiment is that I guess my students managed to keep to become fitter than they used to be, right? Uh, and so my, my point is that I think it's quite exciting what we can start to do. Uh, and when do you think this is useful? Um, it's hard to say, but uh, certainly sports, uh, certain extreme sports where you want to collect a lot of data uh, could be useful. Uh, for example, other users would be in a healthcare setting where you need to have a quick read on a on a patient, uh, whether their you know uh, heart rate is accelerated or not. This can be a very quick visual read, right? Uh, instead of having to go to a computer, you know the nurse can just quickly scan the room and so on. So I think the, you know there's a lot of new applications that will come out of uh, making devices stretchable, uh, notably putting it on things that you wear every day. Beyond uh, heart rate, we can also start to sense sweat. For example, we are able to sense uh, certain chemicals in your sweat, like uh, sodium and so on, using this kind of e-helixes uh, in order to uh, get even a, a more detail right, as to what uh, your health status is. Right? So here's an example, and I'm happy to see if we have uh, even more examples. So for now, I'll sort of switch gears a bit uh, to talk about sensing. Uh, in order to sense the environment, the skin and skin has a lot of different sensors, right? Uh, that are specialized to sense different vibrational frequencies and also different forces, different strength of forces. Some are embedded more superficial to the skin, or some are embedded more deeply. And in materials, you know, fortunately, right, we have uh, very you you know gain quite a good knowledge of how to process materials. 
And one of the things we looked at uh, very early on uh, when I started my research career as a PhD student is to think about, well, how can we structure materials using the same material? Can we change its sensitivity? Well, can we make it more sensitive or less sensitive using the same material? Right? Traditionally, it's difficult, but if we can, again, using structure, right, we can actually influence that. And so we found that if we can create structures that are asymmetrical, for example, like in this case, a pyramid, when you compress this material, the stress is concentrated at the apex. And since the modulus is, is related to the stress over, um, stress over the strain, what happens is that the, the high stress will have to result in a high strain to keep the same modulus, right? And so this is how we can influence the material properties by changing its shape. And these shapes now have been used for all many kinds of sensors. Uh, and when we talk about mechanical sensing, right, uh, there are many types of mechanical resistive, capacitive, elect piezoelectric treble is some example. And we can say use this same strategy in all of these different sensors. And we have explored this in my group, uh, whether it's capacitive, whether it's uh, in tribal and so on. So this same strategy can allow a material to be sensitive to a wide range of forces. Now, in terms of uh, capacitive sensors, which are quite widely used, many of your touch screens are actually capacitive in nature. Uh, we wanted to study, well, if we can compress these shapes, what would be the output? And this will allow us to hopefully design sensors before we even go to the lab to make them, we know how they perform. Uh, before this, uh, before this, many researchers have looked at very uh, large arrays uh, over, over some certain area. But uh, well, what we wanted to do is, well, can we, from one single structure, determine how it will perform? And so we actually uh, you know, uh, used a special machine that indents a single pyramid, in this case, about 50 micron size pyramid. And we're able to study how its mechanical properties change as you apply force, and then we can then map that to a capacitance measurement, which is the electrical property, right? If you put it as a dielectric. And through this, we're able to get uh, a nice match in the calculated response to the measured response. And in fact, uh, this work was also uh, recently published um, where you're able to build some form of search engine, right? Like when you search for answers in Google, maybe you can use uh, some kind of database to search for designs, materials designs that can be used for your application in terms of mechanical sensing. Right, so here's an example where you can quickly build a database uh, through analytical modeling, computing, uh, computational approach, plus uh, matching with experiments. Right, so, so then you know that it actually would work in the real life. So, so this is, um, Good, we got that model done. But as you use soft materials, uh, you start from using polymers, they, are ten they tend to be soft, right? And so then there's another problem. We realize, okay, fine, we can make very good sensors using soft materials, but we can't run away from this property, what we call viscoelasticity, right? So if I play this um, video again, you realize that when you compress a soft material at different time scales, right, depending on the material, they will have this thing called uh, time strain dependent uh, time response uh, time dependent strain response where it slowly recovers and this is what we call viscoelasticity and the softer the material you want to use the soft the greater this viscoelasticity tends to be and so we need a new strategy if we want to use soft materials and the question then becomes well uh, how can we reduce this this type of property and why does it matter it matters because um, in sensors, you know, if you're trying to sense the environment, you want a thing, you want a, you want a single source of truth. Now, if you have this property where it takes time to recover, you would have a problem because you have a pressure value that might correspond to two different inputs. For example, if you're looking at let's say uh, between somewhere here, right, ten to the minus three to ten to the minus two, if you draw a straight line here. What happens is you have two potential pressure values. Now, which one's correct? Um, you can probably use some computer algorithms to figure that out, but then that you know probably relies 
Because some uh, probably may use more energy and you will need to have a more complex software. But if your sensor or your material has low hysteresis or low viscoelasticity, then you would actually have uh, roughly one value, right? For example, if you look at 10 to the minus 4, there's only a one value, one pressure value. So this property, viscoelasticity, has uh, important implications when you're trying to design sensing devices. So we talked about, is there a way we can solve this problem, right? Because it will apply to all soft materials. Uh, and so uh, we thought, well, maybe let's try. And we said, okay, well, we know metals are not very viscoelastic, right? The stiffer materials are not viscoelastic. Uh, maybe we can just combine the two and say, okay, well, let's put metals on soft materials, right? And then we see what happens. It turns out that when you do that, um, we didn't get it to work at the beginning, right? And there was uh, not unexpected, uh, but what's more important, and if many of you are research students or starting your research career or thinking of doing research, is that you need to persevere. And so fortunately, uh, for me, my student persevered. If you were to just take metal and put on top of these uh, structures that we know are quite good at sensing mechanical stress, right? So this is a pyramid, right? As you put metal film on top, when you press on it, it will crack randomly, which you expect. Right? And so this random cracks and makes it not suitable for use. It wasn't reliable. We had a probability of this strategy. And we said, well, the student didn't give up and said, well, let's try to put, let's try to make it more regular. How to do that, right? Uh, one way is to control the, how you crack the material, how you crack the metal. And in order to uh, control it, you actually can put a soft material right on top of these metal films and then uh, compress this uh, metal film. And when you do that, what happens is you see, we start to get more regular cracks. And these cracks are actually along the surface of these structures. So these cracks are what we call the major, major cracks. And these major cracks are quite regular, right? And we found that as you crack more, these major cracks dominate the electrical properties. And so over time, uh, even though you have more cracks, these major cracks uh, uh, have greater impact on your, on your uh, metal film in terms of its electrical properties. The electrical property we measure was conductivity, right? So these cracks, if we can have electrical current flow through this film, as the crack changes or, and we compress, the conductivity should change. And this is what we actually see, right? So the connecting and reconnecting of these cracks will influence the response. And so when we looked at random cracks, what happens is it's an on-off switch. It is on or off, right? Because it's essentially a stat function. But when you have annular cracks, you start to see a change, a gradual change in resistance uh, as you apply pressure. Well, not gradual, but you know, others are going to change, but it's more sensitive than an on-off switch, right? And so annular cracks give you this property of mechanical sensing. Uh, then we studied this type of films versus other type of sense. Found that actually in terms of hysteresis, right, it actually performs really well. Right, one divided by the hysteresis, uh, so the higher number is is better. Uh, sensitivity is plotted on the y y axis, and so sensitivity the higher the better. And we found that actually in terms of peak sensitivity uh, versus hysteresis, we actually managed to outperform many uh, previously uh, reported. Uh, materials that can sense mechanical forces. And so the red and blue dots here was actually the data from our sensors that uh, I just showed you, right? Well, what does this mean? Uh, one, way, one, thing, one way is uh, we can start to build a larger arrays, right? Some of you talked about reliability. So we have started to have larger arrays of these um, sensors, and then you can hopefully uh, get more information quickly. For example, when you touch a surface of your, you know, your fingertip touch a surface, you know is it rough or smooth quite quickly. In fact, most of you probably need to move your fingers across the surface to do that. Uh, but with, if you have enough sensors uh, of the right reliability, what happens is you can you don't need to move the sensors. You just simply apply a fixed force on the on the contact area, and you're able to get uh, a, a various uh, contact pressure maps over time, and these pressure maps can be fed into a machine learning algorithm 
to classify the different types of uh, properties, surface properties. Right? So this is a purely non-optical approach where you don't need vision, you simply need touch. And because the sensor is reliable, you are then able to have better classification of the properties, right? Uh, faster, you get faster and more accurate results from your machine learning models. Right? Many of you probably are interested in AI models. And if you feed an AI model bad data, you're going to get bad results. So in this case, if you feed the model with good data, meaning uh, very reliable data, you're able to get good results in terms of accuracy of whatever you're trying to decide it is. Right, uh, or classify. In this case, we see in this graph, I plot accuracy versus time after contact of this uh, material, the sensor material versus a uh, more hysteretic uh, material. You see that you're actually able to achieve 90 over percent accuracy, right? Uh, sometimes close to 100%, uh, less than about a second or so after contact. So having reliable sensors, giving you reliable output is important for AI models, right? Another fun fun experiment uh, is that we actually can put these sensors on um, fingertips of these uh, robotic hands and you can actually uh, measure uh, pulse rate and, and also maybe the shape of the pulse can tell you if you're healthy or not, right? So these are some of the things that you can do if sensors become more reliable, right? And as we start to develop these tools, we also realize there's an interesting way uh, to use this data, right? For example, we can train medical doctors uh, on how to cut a uh, tissue. If you put sensors, for example, uh, the ones that we developed, in this case, the piezo capacitive sensors, uh, we can, because we can design them from soft uh, to measure soft tissues uh, to very stiff tissues uh, and change the range, what happens is that we can have surgeons train cutting between soft tissues and stiff tissues. For example, stiff tissues could be tumors, right? And so if you put these sensors on a surface and then you have some uh, artificial tumors, they put on top of these sensors, because we can capture a broad range and we can design it, we can actually create a system where we can track how well a surgeon cuts uh, using augmented reality. So here, a surgeon is doing the work, but uh, junior surgeons or the audience is actually looking through the, through the screen of a smartphone or eventually some kind of a HoloLens or VR system, uh, where as you apply pressure, you're able to see how you're cutting, right? Uh, how fast you're cutting, uh, whether your hands are stable. And cutting on soft tissues versus hard tissues will give you very different kinds of uh, results with time, right? And we can actually see that actually if you compared to an accelerometer that measures uh, vibrations very well, you also capture more noise. But if you use a, a material that can sense pressure, uh, you actually are able to get um, much higher quality data, right? That measures the force the surgeon is applying to cut the tissue, right? uh, So here's a, I, I thought it was quite an interesting demonstration and we collaborated with the medical school on this. Right? So, so just a cool, uh, application that maybe is not possible if electronics was, was still very stiff and not able to sense the environment well, right? So we also looked at, I briefly mentioned um, self-healing. Uh, I mean, I briefly mentioned uh, stretchable electronics using eHelix, but this, this work is just uh, starting, right? Uh, we haven't used eHelix yet, but I think there's interest in developing sensors that measure sweat, and there's quite a lot of uh, research right, uh, that has looked at this. In the past, um, doctors actually measure sweat through their sense of taste. And that's clearly not something you would do in today's context. Uh, but then the question is about how do we digitize that the sweat data or the skin fluid data? Uh, we can use electronics that can, in this case, uh, flex and wrap around surfaces, or you can use devices that can stretch like the ones I've shown earlier to put on skin, right? And you can either have different kinds of output. It can be color change or it can be electronic. Now with electronic uh, sensors, you're able to get a higher resolution uh, type of uh, data, right? Uh, and this is because, and, and you need the high resolution because there's a lot of things in sweat 
they are very low concentration. They are very low concentration. Uh, so you need to have electronic means uh, that be able to digitize them at high resolution. So here's a flexible system. We are starting to build stretchable, stretchable ones uh, where you're able to have sweat sensing. This is a collaboration one of uh, some of researchers. So we have the ability to print uh, many soft materials now. So here's an example of uh, printing, printed sensors, right, on, on the electrodes. And then you have flexible circuits, and then you can then transmit this data wirelessly. And there's quite a bit of science in how we design the sensors, but I won't talk about chemical sensing today. Um, but you can see that today, if we have the technology now to be very quickly make flexible devices that can be put on skin and measure sweat data in real time. So this rate trace, um, these different color traces, for example, the green ones is actually a uh, lactate and so on. So you can measure quite a bit of uh, uh, things coming from uh, body fluids. It's quite a thought was uh, interesting. And I think that as we make devices that are more stretchable, they can be even integrated into clothing. Now, another thing why we need um, soft electronic devices uh, is that the skin I mentioned is about one megapascal. Now, if you have a cut, uh, usually if you have a very large cut, happens is the surgeons would then you know kind of sew you up and they use sutures so here's an interesting work uh in collaboration with a wireless expert right in uh in nus john ho uh, where basically they did a very interesting uh, wireless device uh, using uh soft conducting polymers uh, on top of a suture material and so if you have a cut imagine now in the future the suture is actually intelligent enough to tell you whether your wound is healing properly, whether there's infection. Uh, and all this doesn't need battery, right? So there is possible now if you can make soft devices that can give you some electronic readout. And so this is a suture that is actually functionalized uh, with a conducting polymer. And then uh, there's a small electronic uh, antenna, right? That measures the uh, changes in the, in the uh, resonant frequency as your wound heals, right? So then you can then have a, a way to read in real time whether your wound is healing. And this can also be used in uh, below the skin type of applications, right? Where, for example, if you are, have a stomach uh, operation, uh, you know, you have an intestine uh, operation and you're not able to see how well the wound is healing, right? Wirelessly, we can actually see whether there's a leakage, uh, for example, in the stomach, all right, gastric leakage, if it leaks, right, we can actually measure that and track that so that hopefully you can quickly get uh, help if needed. So here's an example, I think another interesting example where why we need modern electronics to stretch is that we can start to think about applications uh, in healthcare, right? That may not be possible if electronics were still a rigid form, right? Obviously, you cannot put a smartphone into your body, right? But if you can design devices that are soft and can conform, then you can start to think about uh, getting data in real time for different kinds of uh, healthcare applications, right? So uh, I think I've come to about one hour uh, in this session. So if you need to you know, take a drink or break, uh, feel free to do that. The next part uh, of my talk will focus a bit on newer concepts around self-healable uh, technologies, right? So maybe I'll just pause maybe for... Uh, for a few, maybe half a minute, uh, where you can you know take a break and things. I know that you know I give very long our uh, long lectures, and uh, students always like my break. So take have a half half a minute break, get a drink. And if you have any questions over the for the earlier parts of the talk, please do leave it in the chat.
Okay, I guess uh, it's roughly about a minute. Uh, hope you had a uh, managed to get a bit of a refresh, get a bit of refreshments or refresh yourselves. Uh, so next, I'll talk about uh, self healing, right? And this was a I thought it was a good, good or bad example. I don't know, but it's a good example of self healing, right? So if you actually hurt yourself, what happens is your skin will form a scar. Uh, start the bleeding and actually recover is uh, functionality, right? So this is how your skin lasts you a lifetime, right? From birth you know, to the end, the skin protects you and uh, makes it, allows it to remain functional. Um, this property is quite difficult to emulate in many things, uh, many devices that you're familiar with. Uh, for example, you can have a smartphone that if you break it, the chances are it will not self-repair. Uh, in fact, you probably will have to send it for a replacement or you buy a new phone. Now that's going to cause eventually, and it's going to cause a bit of a problem. Uh, and we have to think about other strategies uh, beyond recycling to allow devices to last longer. Uh, it's becoming, uh, eventually, I think it will become a very big uh, challenge for society. Right, if we continue to generate a lot of electronic waste. Uh, and so maybe uh, in the future, if your phone can self-repair, you will need to throw it away or can last longer, right? Uh, and then by the time, maybe there are new technologies that allow it to be more efficiently recycled. So self-healing is an interesting idea that uh, potentially allows electronic devices to be more sustainable. Now, of course, this is a big problem given uh, you know, I think there's a lot of greater awareness of uh, of climate uh, issues and climate change and the damage we're doing. Uh, in fact, uh, this uh, was uh, quite uh, just last year. We have 57 uh, million tons of uh, of e-waste generated. Right? So it's it's becoming a big problem. And uh, self healing, uh, we did quite a, a careful study actually in this uh, review paper. Is, uh, is that the concept of self-healing isn't exactly very uh, new. In fact, in fact the, the, the first self-healing material that was proposed all the, came all the way from the Romans where they were making structural materials uh, self-heal, for example, concrete. Right? Uh, in ancient Rome, they actually made a self-healing concrete. I thought that was really interesting, but they were very structural. Uh, but of course, as we develop more sophisticated devices, we want to have electronic functionality, right? So we're starting to move towards uh, functional self-healing materials. And this has been, I would say, an uh, explosion of uh, ideas from all over uh, internationally on how we can have, how we can do that. And that is really through the design of chemical uh, bonds, uh, different types of chemistry uh, that devices to heal. Uh, some of the first uh, first early early works were using uh, fairly high temperature conditions to heal uh, cracks in polymers and they were mostly function against structural. Uh, but towards the uh, 2010s uh, and, and onwards, people started to think about functional uh, devices and uh, in, in 2012, for example, you know we actually proposed the first concept of a self-healing electronic skin. This was uh, done uh, with Zanan in Stanford, where we have this uh, composite material that can self-heal. And since then, there's just been a lot more, uh, I would say, uh, excellent ideas 
around the world trying to look at how we can develop functional self-healing materials. In terms of self-healing properties or process, there are many different kinds. Uh, for example, if your skin uses a regenerative uh, process where it makes new cells. And that, of course, relies some kind of energy uh, you know, from that you consume. In artificial materials that don't have living cells, uh, there is uh, no way to regenerate. Uh, so we have to be, uh, we will have to be a bit more creative, and we have to do, uh, we have to use more chemistry, uh, and we can split the different types of pro self healing process into extrinsic, intrinsic, autonomous or non autonomous. Right? autonomous meaning you will automatically heal. Non autonomous meaning you need some form of external stimuli, whether it's uh, temperature, whether it's other chemicals, uh, and so on. Or light. And so these are uh, quite nicely summarized. Uh, if you're interested, you can uh, feel free to uh, read it. But what I'm interested in is to develop materials that are generally autonomous and they can heal automatically without you um, needing any en too much energy input, just like for example, room temperature. Uh, and also they can heal multiple times. Right? And so that's quite, uh, I think, important because then it's a bit more closer to human skin. Right? So that's uh, my area of interest. Uh, so we um, came up with uh, this transparent ionogel uh, material. If you look at the video here, there's a scar that we cut on top of this material that we place uh, behind a, a name card, right? And so if you cut this material, what happens is that it's able to uh, self-repair. It actually starts to uh, uh, form back its original surface. And this is done at room temperature. I thought that was really, really interesting. Uh, what's even more interesting is that we can, because this material, the way we designed it, uh, it allows it to also heal uh, in uh, very wet environments like underwater. Right? So if you usually if you take a piece of uh, tape and you put some water on it, it loses that stickiness. Right? In this case, even if you cut the material and you put it underwater, uh, it's hydrophobic enough to repel uh, the water molecules Right, and actually start to recover its, its uh, interface, the damaged interface. Right? So when you try to uh, pull on this, you see that the interface is healing. Right? Uh, and so this was, I thought, uh, quite, a, quite a cool uh, concept. And we started to explore a lot of these, these uh, concepts. If you're interested, you know, I think uh, don't have too much time, but you can read a paper and maybe contact me or if you want to find out more. So we can then make this functional. Right? How to make it functional? Uh, we can use four wire probes, right? Uh, basically measuring the changes in electrical properties, right, uh, of this material because it's actually a somewhat semiconductive material. Uh, using a four wire system, which are one of the oldest uh, older touchscreen systems, they use these four wires. You're able to measure where you touch it. Uh, there was some, of course, you have to do some calibration, but uh, you can actually get pretty decent uh, resolution uh, for such a such a material that can self heal. And really, this was uh, also inspired by, I think, uh, SNU faculty, right? Uh, quite done some quite nice work using hydrogels. Our, our wasn't a hydrogel, uh, it's an ionogel uh, that can self uh, recover. So in this case, I think uh, this was a hydrogel that could sense touch. You can put it on skin and it's biocompatible. Uh, but we actually incorporated self healing functionality. And I think that's just a lot more room to explore. Now, what if you want uh, machines to be even smarter and react faster, then you want to uh, be able to measure even before the object touches uh, the robot or the surface. So we call this ability to sense nearness, proximity. And as you come close to an object, well, humans, we actually unable to sense proximity. For example, uh, if somebody, uh, well, unless you have sixth sense, you might, if somebody comes to close to the back, you can maybe you know hear and so on. You can try to guess at something, but we don't really uh, sense how close the person is. Now, if but we can actually design self healing materials that can do that uh, if we de if we design them properly. And so this was a, a work that um, we call AI foam or artificially innovated foam, uh, where we have this material be able to measure how close your human finger. Uh, is to the surface. And this is really quite uh, nice, um, I would say, 
uh, idea because it allows machines then to react faster. And traditionally, if you have the same kind of uh, material, uh, they usually are unable to sense uh, proximity. But if you design it properly, you can. And the way we did it was, well, we know we have some knowledge about self-healing materials, right? So we use a lot of uh, self-healing uh, concepts here in this polymer. Uh, but then we incorporated, uh, again, the idea of a composite. So we take uh, existing materials that maybe are conductive, uh, and then we actually process them into a co composite that get hopefully have the advantage of uh, many different office base components and then maybe allow you to do more, right? So this is this material is actually a foam material. It has a lot of pores. And these pores uh, has metal particles, right? That can come close uh, or far apart depending on uh, the pressure, right? And then we actually created uh, electrodes that actually puncture or poke into this foam. Uh, and this process is a simple casting process. So it's not too complicated. Just put the composite uh, material on top, uh, let it cure or, uh, overnight, and then basically you start to get this foam, right? And this was a quite interesting uh, um, microstructure, actually. Uh, and then this pause will allow you to actually sense electric fields. And so by doing that, you can create the proximity sensors, right? And in some ways, it's a bit like skin because skin is innervated by nerves uh, at different uh, levels. Uh, but skin doesn't have the ability to sense electrical uh, fields. Uh, with electronics, we can. And so we can actually create a self-healing uh, material that can also sense proximity. Uh, what's interesting about this concept is that I shown a table uh, figure where you had piezo-resistive, piezo-capacitive, piezo-triboelectric, uh, piezo-electric, and so on. So this material can operate as both a resistive sensor and also a capacitive sensor by the virtue of this design, right? Here we have plots that show the piezo, resistor cha piezo resistance changes. So as you apply pressure, piezo just means pressure. So as you apply pressure changes, you can measure changes in resistance. And we show that actually with, uh, if we have these three dimensional electrodes that puncture into the material, right? You can uh, measure pressure, uh, but not only that, it's able to, um, it measures that uh, better than if the electrodes were flat. Right. Uh, at the same time, uh, we can also measure, uh, in this case, uh, uh, in this case, it's basically a loading uh, versus unloading. Right. Uh, again, we compare to planar, and we compare uh, different kinds of uh, composite concentration. Uh, we see that actually having different concentrations of the composite. In this case, it's a uh, nickel. Uh, we can actually change the sensitivity, and it's also again more sensitive. Right, uh, in, in if it's capacitance, uh, two, three, if it's three dimensional electrodes, right? So, uh, this is, uh, I would say, interesting concept because then your circuits, uh, as long as they can handle both resistors and capacitors uh, measurement, then you're able to uh, create a system that can do proximity plus uh, pressure, right? Uh, if interested, you know, feel free to contact me again after this. Now, uh, most smartphones today have a screen that lights up. Uh, the, so we wondered if, okay, we solved, or rather we created a concept where we're able to measure touch quite well. Uh, it can also self-heal because it's transparent and it can self-heal, can be used as a, like a touch screen. Uh, but we can also make devices emit light. And that's an important form of feedback to humans. My vision is still an important form of feedback. And there has been uh, quite nice work that started to think about making stretchable light sources. And these are what we call light emitting capacitors or LECs. Uh, uh, in 2016, there was a uh, work by uh, Shepard and the same year, uh, another professor I know, Prissy Lee, uh, also uh, kind of uh, had almost the same time came out with these uh, stretchable light sources. And these light sources have two things, two inputs, uh, voltage and frequency, right? So it actually requires what we call an alternating current alternating uh, voltage to light up and is a how bright it is a function of frequency and voltage and when we looked at it we said oh yeah it's cool right because i'm interested in stretchable electronics um and we looked at what are some of the challenges uh in terms of device performance and we realized that actually a lot of these uh, stretchable 
uh, light emitting devices are actually quite low in terms of its light output. It doesn't have very high luminance, and luminance can be measured by candela per meter square. Uh, basically, it's a light sensor they use to measure this and you get a value out of. Most smartphones that you have are more than 200, right? So many of the good, expensive ones, you know, have 1,000 candelas. So we thought that, well, maybe there's something here that we can do. Well, we can increase the brightness or maybe we, uh, at the same time, make it self-healing. Uh, and we also found out another problem is that a lot of these light emitting capacitors require higher frequencies uh, that are of the hearing range that humans can pick up. And so it becomes a bit irritating. So you have something like, uh, you need to say if you have a higher frequency, six kilohertz or so, you might be able to hear it. And then uh, it can be irritating to the humans. So we have to have a strategy that allows it to operate uh, much brighter and also uh, lower frequencies. So that was our sort of, um, I guess, certain limitations that we found with existing systems. And so we saw, well, maybe we can do something about it. And so we created a high K material that self heals and is able to uh, allow very bright light output from such devices. So here is just a, is a schematic, right? Showing two materials that when cut can be joined together and they can have different colors depending on the uh, material, the particles that you use. And these LECs rely on um, zinc sulfide particles doped with, with certain impurities. Uh, basically, as you put the cut interface together, they can actually recover itself and then actually uh, still remain functional, lighting up. And it can also uh, stretch. So you have these, uh, capacitor structure, we use the self-healing transparent conductors we developed earlier that can heal underwater. And then we created this insulating material that has high K or high capacitance, uh, high dielectric constant. And because of this, it's able to generate very high brightness. Uh, if you look at dielectric constant measurements, we're actually getting uh, many times over what most people have been using, which are silicones. Uh, silicones have usually a dielectric constant, you know, between three to five. But in our material at, you know, 100 to a kilohertz, uh, we have at least uh, three to four times more uh, higher dielectric constant than uh, silicones. So as a result, we actually get very high brightness. We actually have uh, over a thousand candelas uh, at very low electric fields, right? So the voltage needed is also lower. So here's an example. We compare traditional uh, materials uh, versus what we use, we call it Helios material. You can see that the frequency is quite low, about 500 hertz, which means you can't really hear them. Uh, voltage is also quite low, and you can see it's much brighter than the uh, traditional materials and also quite comparable to, a, to an, I would say, average smartphone. The high K, how does it work? Is that it actually allows, and we did some simulations, uh, basically to understand electric field distribution, we see that every having these high K materials uh, allows the field, electric fields to be more concentrated at these particles, which then allows the light generation uh, to be more efficient. So there's kind of uh, one reason why it worked. Now, if you use a traditional material uh, and you puncture it, because of the high electric field, it would have the same it would have a problem, right? Because firstly, you have high electric field. And then when you remove the puncture, you actually create a defect. And because there's a defect, it actually can uh, result in catastrophic failure because of the high electric fields, right? So you actually see the device burn up. This was a silicone device. Now, if you actually use the Helios material, uh, you can, because we can operate at lower fields, right? So the, we can lower the electric field, get the same brightness. Uh, we can puncture this device. And then this device actually can light up, right? Uh, even with the needle inside. And then when you remove the needle, it actually can fully restore its light emitting capabilities. Um, you know, I'm hopefully I'm hopeful that people will start to use these devices for different things. Uh, right now, we we've uh, proven that it can work, right? Uh, what we've thought of is well, maybe in soft robots, having this light source uh, in dark environments. Uh, can allow it to first sense objects, right? If you have a sen sensor, uh, at the same time, maybe give some visual output, for example, flash, uh, to tell you that, oh, you know, it found something. Uh, and I don't know where it will eventually lead to, but I certainly hope that people are interested in soft robotics 
uh, can use such such devices All right so i think i come to sort of uh, the end of my uh, one and a half hours presentation i think that one of the things that inspired me when as a, when i was young and the reason i started to really look into this field to make robots smarter is that we are able to create science fiction uh, technologies that in science fiction now become science fact right so i think there's a lot of uh, exciting things that many of you have many more years uh, compared to me right to uh, develop and explore so i hope you will use your time wisely uh, in your undergraduate uh, career and uh, also postgraduate career uh, to enable right and so we're now starting to see we have robots that can perform surgery of course with the help of a, of a doctor but in the future maybe they don't need uh, the doctor the doctor can be downloaded to the robot and you can replace a hand if you lose a hand right uh you get a better hand maybe that actually sends sense better right than, than your own uh, organic so i think there's a lot of exciting uh, opportunities here i think importantly i think there's a lot of things we can do with soft uh, devices soft sensing devices for example uh, if you have uh, amputation right now it's a big problem uh, in many parts of the world in fact in singapore we have four amputations a day so by the end of today, we have four people that have lost, you know, whether it's just a finger or a toe or a limb, just because of uh, diabetes. Right? And so hopefully in the future, we can have technologies that can allow them to restore the sense of touch uh, more readily. Right? So today, I'd like to sort of end and close. I think we have about four or five minutes left for questions. Uh, you can go to the same link and enter your questions, or you can put it in the chat. Uh, great, thank you so much, uh, Benjamin, for the great talk. So, as he mentioned, you can post your questions to the link or just uh, type in the chat box. Yeah, I haven't seen that system, the poll, the, the oh, system poll that you're using. Yeah, that's really interesting. Yeah, yeah, it's quite a good tool, I think, to uh, engage mm -hmm. and to engage students, especially if there's so many virtual uh, right. talks. Right? So yeah, feel free to check it out. I think it's very useful. Oh so other yeah, systems, definitely. Yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. Uh, while we are waiting for answers, I also have a few questions. So maybe I can just uh, ask directly. You. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, please. Yeah. So in the uh, first part, where throughout your lecture, you show that. So you show how you realize all the great functionalities, and it seems you use uh, whether the materials that are readily available, but by cleverly designing the microstructures or device structures, you can realize all the functions. So I'm just wondering if uh, whether you feel the need to develop a new material, or you think you have the materials that we have are enough, and just designing or the fabricating them is more important step for realizing those like intelligent uh, devices. What do you think? Yeah, I think it's a it's a good point and very good question. Thank you for that, Heijin. So I think uh, it depends ultimately on uh, on what you hope to achieve and then the time frame you want to achieve them. Uh, so uh, for example, uh, the e helix well, was quite straightforward. We took wire, we structure it, and it becomes stretchable. Uh, and that was fast. Uh, but then if you wanted to develop uh, new functionalities that may not have been there before, mm -hmm. uh, then you may want to look at developing new materials. Uh, for example, the self-healing materials, those the two uh, show actually were new materials uh, that we developed, but they were made from existing available um, chemistry and materials. So for me, I'm interested to get things into uh, the real world quickly, right? So I think using existing materials and taking a hybrid approach mm -hmm. uh, made a lot of sense. Uh, but if you are interested in making, um, you know, things that may require longer term, uh, then you have maybe have to invent new chemistry. And so then unfortunately, I'm not, uh, I'm not a chemist, right? So <laughs> I don't uh, make new uh, chemicals, at least not in my lab. Uh, so I do have to collaborate. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a mix between, uh, you know, how, this, how fast you want to prove that concept mm -hmm. uh, to the, you know, how, how new the concept is, and then you have to decide 
right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I see. But as an engineer, I like to solve problems. And so we have to look at uh, different problems we can solve, uh, hopefully mm -hmm. quickly, right? Mm -hmm. And then uh, and then if you want to work on longer term projects, usually you can do that through collaborations. For example, the uh, prosthetic device you know, will require somebody to implant, you know, mm -hmm. uh, the electrodes into the nervous system and those will take a long long time right nice. uh, so so it's not something that one lab can easily right. do right? so, so <laughs> it's a measure is yeah that's right so it's a trade-off between speed and complexity mm -hmm. yeah. okay. and also i mean it seems you really cover like really broad range of functionalities from bio to some like sensing and all those stuff so I'm just curious, since this lecture is targeted for like senior undergrad students, so I'm just wondering, mm -hmm. what do you like to, uh, how do you, I mean, what kind of a specific knowledge would you encourage your student to study for your particular field of the study? Uh, yeah, I think, I think uh, it's a good question for me personally. I think it's sort of, uh, you do best as something you're most interested in. Mm -hmm. uh, so I would say my suggestion is uh, first you have to find a way you have to try a lot of new things mm -hmm. and you all of you the students have a lot I would say more uh, time right to do that and I think uh, especially at the undergraduate level please spend mm -hmm. different spend your time taking all kinds of uh, classes or attending lectures that you know you may not even have thought about attending and just go and try. Uh, through that, then you have, first of all, then you sort of train yourself to be curious, right? especially I think most of you are in science engineering, curiosity is very important. Uh, so you, you want to be curious about what other people or what other uh, disciplines are, are talking about. And then through the ex exercise, you can start to find out what you like to do. And hopefully what you like to do is also what you're good at doing. Right? And then you can really, uh, achieve you know uh in a quicker more efficient paced pace uh on out uh, results right so if you're interested in uh, graduate school for example many of you probably are i think it's important to look at uh, the fields you might be interested in for me uh, my experience is i was just very intrigued by the idea that maybe we can use organic materials to perform computation that was just the that was the sort of the general trigger and i say okay but then what do you do eventually i ended up working on sensors the reason is because i thought that was very important for machines uh, in order for them to become more intelligent mm -hmm. right so along the way you know you will sort of have some mean some meanders and you figure out what you really end up doing right and even if you don't do a postgraduate degree i think uh in in the work environment having a bit of curiosity mm -hmm. uh would, would uh, bring you quite far along, especially as you progress in your career, right? To start to engage people, mm -hmm. uh, different kinds of across different disciplines. So you need that basic curiosity. Mm -hmm. I see. So you really emphasize curiosity, right? And yeah, yeah, and so sort of, yeah, and trying different things. Right? Don't be afraid. Right. Try different things. I I definitely agree with 